Hi, this is Greg Kilstrom. Welcome to season three of the Agile World, where we discuss customer and employee experience, organizational and workforce transformation, and how business can adapt and continually improve in an Agile age. The Agile World podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full stack technology services, talent services, and real world application. For more information, go to techsystems.com. To read more about the topics discussed in this show, you can go to my website at theagile.world and read my latest articles or get a copy of my latest book, The Agile Workforce, now available on Amazon and other retailers. My name is Greg Kilstrom, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of CareerGig and host of the Agile World podcast. Today, we're going to talk about how brands stay innovative in an agile world while staying true to your values and mission. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome Susan Meyer of Susan Meyer Studios. Uh, Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You know, your background started in consulting and the agency world, working with some of the world's top brands. What led you to start your own company? So a combination of things. Um, One of the largest of which is that I had very small children at home. And um, it was hard to work in an agency setting where, you know, you are beholden to the client's schedule. There was a lot of travel. Um, and I found that really challenging. Um, and then other things that I was looking forward to professionally about working for myself was the ability to really cherry pick the kinds of projects that I wanted to do, um, as well as do the type of work that I wanted to do. So in an agency setting, as you're familiar with, it's typically there's sort of different silos. And I think this is actually getting better. You know, I, uh, this is 10 years ago now that I started my company, but Um, You know, the world is very much siloed in the agency world between strategists and creatives. Um, And I kind of straddle both of those worlds. And so I felt like by, you know, running my own agency, running my own business, um, I could do the work that I wanted to do. Um, And I, you know, I contract out for other stuff that I'm, you know, I'm not a logo designer, for example. Um, So I certainly contract out for that stuff. Um, But it's been really gratifying to be able to sort of say, I can leverage the the talents that I have, I can pursue the interests that I have um, in my own portfolio of work. And then just an unexpected upside was that it turns out I really love being an entrepreneur. I definitely did not know that about myself at all when I started the business. And that was a big fear that I had, um, you know, would I, how would I enjoy that environment where you're constantly, you know, doing business development or hunting for your next job? And would I be able to, you know, run the administrative side of it? And it turns out I really love that part. So that all worked yeah. out. Yeah, that's, and that that's, that's fortunate because as you mentioned, a lot of people find out they don't <laughs> like that part, right? And, yeah. and it's, uh, or, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's parts that I know, you know, myself, I, I've been, uh, you know, a solopreneur. I've been part an employee. Uh, what a, you know, you name it. I've played one of those roles. There's certainly things that you lo- probably like more than others, but I think it is it is an important thing to think through. Is like, um, can do you want to do it all? Is it you know is is that a is that a comfortable feeling of as you mentioned getting your own work and doing doing the work? And even if you don't do a hundred percent of it, you're still you're still responsible for it. So that's, yeah, that, that's, that's great to hear that, um, that, that worked out. Uh, what, what do you think, um, what do you think you get the opportunity to do that you didn't get to do, um, you know, working at a larger, larger agency, like what, what new opportunities kind of presented themselves? Um, so a couple of different dimensions to that. One is, um, you know, working in different industries, um, and I'll talk a little bit about each of them. And then the other is more the piece that I was talking about straddling the strategy and creative. So, um, I went to school as an artist, you know, I studied art and art history in my undergrad major. Um, but my first job out of undergrad was with the Boston consulting group. And so professionally, I really came up through the strategy channel Um, And so when I was working in agencies, I was a strategist and I really felt um, frustrated, um, you know, that it was awesome to have a team of beautiful designers working with me. But my my creative process, you know, when I'm writing a deck, for example, I actually need to design it first. And that then helps me craft the message And so, you know, we would be doing stuff like, okay, why don't you strategist write a Word document, you know, write the story, put in the numbers, and then shoot it over to design and they'll make it look pretty. And I like couldn't work like that because I'm so visual. 
And yeah. so, and, and I also just enjoy, I mean, call me crazy, but I enjoy designing presentations. So, um, so I get to do some of that stuff. And, and by the way, I think it adds a lot of value for clients to have the same person, you know, that you're not throwing something over the transom and then something gets lost in translation. You have the same person kind of holistically working on, you know, crafting your brand story, for example. Um, and then the other piece, the, the industry piece, I definitely, if you had told me 10 years ago that I would end up running a business that is almost entirely comprised of healthcare, I would have said, I would have laughed. <laughs> I had no yeah. healthcare background. I, you know, I was certified as a yoga teacher. I was interested in wellness, but um, I, I watched a lot of medical TV shows when I was a kid, but that was about right, it. Right. right. But it turns out that some, somehow those things like really did comprise, a, I'm fascinated with the healthcare world. Um, but it really came to me by accident. And, you know, that's another like really fun thing about being an entrepreneur and running your own business. And you get out there and you go like, at least in the first couple of years, you go like, I'll take anything that comes to me, right? Like right, right. I'll do any work that anyone's willing to pay me for. And when you have that moment that you open to those possibilities, surprising things come up. Um, so I, uh, you know, had done as many branding marketing folks um, uh, will, you know, have had this experience agencies typically in branding typically the bread and butter is in consumer goods, um, you know, in uh, food and beverage, I had done most of my work in, um, also a little bit of personal care. Um, but those are the big consumer brands that have the budgets to hire agencies and that do interesting work. So I was kind of trained in that consumer facing mindset. And um, I continued to do, you know, when I started my own company, I continued to do work in that world. But what I found is that, um, you know, the sort of friends and friends and friends that were coming, friends of friends that were coming to me with work, um, there was work in the tech space, there was work in healthcare. And I just said yes to everything. And healthcare was particularly challenging and interesting because it was like learning a completely new language. Um, and then I got really excited about it as well, because it felt like um, there was so much more purpose in it right? Like the stuff that you're doing is helping people survive breast cancer or, you know, it's much more than like putting cereal on the table for your kids. Um, and so for me, that, that was really what got me hooked. And then you learn this new language and you're like, I'm really cool. Like I speak Mandarin, right? Like, you know, all right, that. right. Yeah. And so, um, so I now do almost all of my work in healthcare. I do a lot of work in, um, you know, digital health. Um, and uh, I've also worked with a lot of biotech brands, um, big and small. Um, and so that's been really exciting. Is it? Um, I know I found it this way, but just curious if you feel the same way. I, I think the idea of learning um, is incredibly attractive as part of the part of the whether that's solopreneur or small business or or whatever. I just, I found myself running a, running a small to mid-sized agency, um, and growing that, that, uh, yeah, I mean, we took, we took all kinds of work. We ended up specializing in financial services, um, towards the end, which was its own, you know, education for me, cause I am not a finance person, but, um, do you think that learning is, is part of the, part of the attraction to, to doing a lot of things yourself? Uh, definitely. I am such a lifelong learner type person. Um, I'm, I'm really curious about so many different things. And I think from what you were saying about your career path earlier, I think you and I also share that like zigzag path, right? Yeah. Through our careers, yeah. because I'm interested in so many different things. I wish I had time to have 10 different careers. And so I think that makes me, it certainly makes me uniquely suited to be a consultant. Um, definitely no accident that that's what I was drawn into, um, you know, sort of instead yeah. of having to choose a career, I can get to do all of them, you know, for three months at a time. And, um, and cer certainly that learning aspect is very um, powerful and gratifying for me and um, learning something as new and complicated as um, the healthcare ecosystem um, is certainly something that attracted me to that. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's uh, let's switch gears a little bit here and talk about brands and um, and agility for for a little bit. So, um, I, and we talked a little bit before the um, before this recording about uh, branding and, and agility. But why don't you um, why don't you define what what does agile brand mean to you? 
So and I, I love the word agile, and I think we don't use it enough in the world of branding and marketing. Um, I feel like I see that word used more in strategy, like traditional st- operations, that sort of world, um, or management. Um, yeah. But yeah. I think in terms of branding, um, you know, being agile is incredibly important. And I think we talk about it more in terms of like a brand refresh or um, evolving the brand. But agile to me in the context of branding just means that you're keeping up with the times, you're connecting with your customers and meeting them where they are and where they are by definition continues to move all the time. Um, and so you need to stay fresh and relevant. Um, both in terms of what your offerings are and also in terms of what your messaging is and where that messaging gets delivered. Um, so I think being agile is incredibly relevant in the branding world. So um, how does how does a company understand both how agile it is as well as how agile should it be? What What's the... Um, you know, particularly when it comes to, to branding, marketing and, and all those things, how, how would you recommend that someone measure that or even assess that? Yeah, I mean, I think there's two components and you'll often see like an agency's branding and innovation become all one thing. And I think that, you know, for, for the reason that they are intertwined and, and I think that the two pieces, what I'll call positioning and messaging, which is more like how you talk about yourself as a brand and how you strategically like carve out your spot, your niche in the marketplace is slightly different from, although of course related to innovation, which is, you know, what new products or services or weight experiences are you going to offer into the marketplace? Um, and so I think on both of those dimensions, um, you know, there's there's different ways that agility might show up. Um, so, you know, the innovation one is particularly clear, right? Like you're innovating. Therefore, you know, you need to have, create a culture around um, nurturing new ideas, coming up with new ideas. And there's different ways to do that. Um, but, you know, everything from like the Google model of, you know, take time off each week or each month or do sabbaticals um, to a more collaborative um, setting with specific tools like a design thinking type of model. Um, so there's different ways, but I don't think it matters what way you approach it. It's more about like the mindfulness of saying, hey, we want to create a culture that's nimble, agile, innovative. Let's sit down and think about how we do that. I think on the positioning and messaging side, um, it's more about keeping in touch with customers, constantly doing insight work, you know, talking, not just surveys and quantitative research, although that's, of course, important um, to give you like a big picture read, but really speaking, whether it's focus groups, one on ones, depends on your, you know, budget and your industry, but really getting face to face with customers and listening to them, not just about how they use your product, but about their whole world and what it's comprised of. And so, and that will create this agile culture where your messaging can evolve and stay relevant to your audience. Yeah, that, no, that's, that's great. And, and that, that touches on some of the ways that you might um, help that agility. I guess when you're, when you're doing that, um, I'm sure you've met some objections or, Um, some, let's say the word agile, it's, I don't think it's a controversial word, but it does, um, those more conservative people that are, and, you know, health aspects of, of the healthcare industry, for instance, are more conservative than others. I mean, I would imagine the biotech, it's a little, um, you know, more pushing innovation and, and stuff like that than some other areas. But, you know, when you meet some objections to, um, trying to maintain this agility and, and all that. How do you, you know, what, what are some of those objections maybe? And, and how do you, how do you counter those? Yeah. I mean, in healthcare, like you said, there's this huge regulatory environment looming in the background, HIPAA compliance, messaging has to be approved through like a lengthy process. And so they're less um, able to refresh, for example, messaging uh, than you can with a consumer brand. 
Um, I don't do like advertising, for example. I don't do any consumer facing messaging. So I don't come run yeah. into that problem very much. Um, but even in the work that I do, which is largely B2B, is it, it looms in the background. Like you just know that that's always something that you keep in the back of your head and it is going to play out in different contexts. Um, I think that, you know, what I try to bring to the healthcare world, I mean, what I bring is only what I can bring, right? I, I'm, I'm a consumer marketer by background. And so when a healthcare company hires me, they know what they're getting. They're not getting a healthcare marketer. <laughs> so they're coming to me right, right. because they want somebody who's got fresh thinking, who like lives outside their world. Um, and there's plenty of awesome healthcare marketing agencies um, that they could go to if they want, um, you know, more inside the party line. So, frankly, I don't run into that too much as a challenge just by like selection bias. Like the people who are coming yeah. to me already um, either don't have those hurdles in the same ways or they're really looking for somebody to jump those hurdles. And so they've cleared the way for me. Okay. Okay. That's interesting. Um, I guess going back to the the agile brand concept. So one of the things that I talked about in my in my book called called the agile brand was this idea of. I mean, I met I met some um, uh, skepticism, I guess, when I from from my friends in branding when I when I said, "Hey, I've, I'm writing this book. It's called the Agile Brand." They're like, "Well, you know, brands really shouldn't change overnight and every day and all that kind of stuff." And so, you know, when I kind of explained the concept, it's you know, that, that as you described very well earlier, um, some things do need to change and the world is changing, but like brands need to evolve over time as well. But there are some things uh, that don't, that shouldn't change, like mission values, things like that need to maintain and, and you shouldn't change your values um, very often, if ever, because um, they're really what kind of makes up the, the company. How do you... Um, how would you coach um, a brand to understand that and kind of keep those things in balance? Yeah, this is this is such a classic uh, challenge in the branding world. It's this this dance, like a delicate yeah. balance between you don't want to do you built up this particularly for big iconic brands. Right. Um, right. You've built all this equity. And it's incredible to even when you when you actually do the numbers to think about like the color on the logo or the because I used to do a lot of logo design and redesign work. And you have to be so careful with every single element that you as a consumer would never even think about that those things have so much quantifiable value. So you don't want to walk away from the stuff that you spent all this time um, you know, building value in, whether it's the shape of your M&M or the, you know, tilt of the M in your logo, right. things have unimaginable value. On the other hand, so, so the challenge is how do you move forward without leaving behind any value on the table? And that's yeah. what, you know, that's the cautionary tale where you've got like the Mrs. Butterworth and Aunt Jemima still running around in this world and like, right now that that's being cleaned, <laughs> cleaned up, but, but, you know, you think, how, how does the, how is that still here? And it's, because right. it's so hard for companies to walk. They, they can quantify the value of that brand equity and they're terrified of not being recognized in that example on the grocery shelf. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that is a real conundrum for brands. It's easier for younger brands. It's easier for, B2B brands, right? Um, yeah. you know, it's hardest yeah. for fast moving consumer goods that are more, you know, low price point uh, mass market products. But um, yeah. Yeah. I guess when you're, when you're main um, to your point, like when, when one of the main um, val or uh, wow, words are escaping me at the moment, but one of the main assets of your brand is its recognizability. Let's just say that. Um, whether that's the logo or whether it's the tagline or whatever, whatever that, that may be, I guess the stakes get higher, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think yeah. you know, on the point that you made about, so I was giving that example in the visual sphere, like on, you know, logos and packaging, but the point you also made another thing that's kind of core to the brand identity can be the mission and the vision and the values. And when do you think about, 
like evolving that. And I think something that we're seeing right now is a bunch of brands kind of jumping on the bandwagon of like, oh, now we have to put like diversity into our mission or whatever. Right, or we right. say that we're, you know, uh, we're environmentally friendly. So like, let's like, I don't know, donate to some stuff. And, you know, what I say about that stuff is that, you know, while I support everybody wanting to support those things and they should, you need to also be kind of authentic about if it's really going to go into your value statement or it's really going to go into like, here's what our brand DNA is. It has to come from a place of truth. Otherwise, it's not creating any brand value. I mean, go ahead yeah. and make the donation by all means. But like, you you know, Patagonia is a brand that's built on sustainability, environmentalism. That all makes sense together. If you're going to come in and say, oh, we're an environmental, it has to make sense. So yeah. I think it's also, you know, there's another conundrum. It's like, how do you, you may genuinely, as a, genuinely, genuinely as a company want to embrace those values, but you have to find a tether to like what your brand, your product, your company, something is all about in order to make that leap. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And and yes, it's, you know, on, on the one hand, it's like, well, shame on some of these brands for not having strong values in all along and, and now just sort of adopt it. And, and yeah, by no means should they, um, they should definitely embrace um, all of those. Th I mean, all of those things you mentioned are, are very important. It's just, it is, I like, I like that, that idea of like finding that tether. And I mean, if you're, if your values are strong and, and well-defined at all in the first place, there is a way, you know, if you, if you have a strong mission and strong values, there is a way to meaningfully and, and authentically to use that word, your, the word you used as well, there is a way to do that. And, you know, as you know, consumers are getting smarter and, and they're smart enough to know when it's not, it's not authentic. And they point it out, whether it's a Super Bowl commercial or a, whatever the case may be, like they, they can smell it a mile away. And um, so, yeah, nobody's, nobody wins by tacking something on. They, they win by integrating it. And, you know, there's companies that have been doing really, really good work and not talking about it for decades. And, um, and you know, it's, it's really interesting when, when you find out, oh, wow, they have this foundation that I had no idea. And then maybe later at some point they start talking about it. And, you know, that's, that's good because it's already been part of their culture for, for, for years. Yeah. Mars, um, the candy company was a, a client of mine for a long time. And they have this, exactly as you're saying, that the family has this foundation, which is, you know, it's related to the company, um, but it's a but it's a foundation that does all sorts of super cool things like, you know, creating a seed bank for heirloom um, plants and vegetables um, so that they survive. And, you know, like all these yeah, amazing wow. things that they don't talk about or publicize. And, um, you know, we occasionally were called to sort of do a, like a little consumer project that's based on one of those things. And you're like, this is so cool that we have this to tap into, particularly yeah. in light of the fact, you know, they're a candy company. They're not, you know, saving lives. Right. Um, right. And they have this like genuine um, piece of their business and, and piece of their DNA that um, that is, you know, all about saving lives. So it's great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, one last question before we wrap up. Um, so you've been a business owner for the last 10 years um, and, and, and counting here. Um, what changes have you seen in, in your area of the industry? And, and what, do you, what do you anticipate over the next 10 years? Like what, what's, what are the trends that you're seeing that are going to change the way that you do business and, and really in the, in, in the worlds that you run in? I mean, I, with the, at the risk of sounding fairly obvious, but but the the biggest shift has been uh, in all ways digital. So you know, when I wasn't you know ten years ago isn't that long ago, but ten years ago, five years ago, I was still coming into a room. Let's just start there. I was coming into a room for a meeting, right? right. <laughs> right? Yeah. I was coming into a room with a stack of printed decks, which was obsolete already because we of course had the technology to project on a screen but at that time it was sort of like 
if you're creative, especially if you're a creative with a capital C, you yeah. printed beautiful things. That's what you did, right? Like that was your stock and trade. And so we were, you know, working still in that old artisanal way, even though everything we were doing in the background, of course, was created digitally. It, it sort of still looked as if the designer had made a watercolor sketch and brought it in. And I think that has, pre-COVID, um, was a huge shift in just the last five years where I almost never go on site to see clients, maybe in the beginning of a relationship, but everything, you know, everything was already for me on Zoom. Um, yeah. And um, like nobody wants printed stuff. There's no cachet anymore in coming with like a beautiful printed book. Clients aren't asking me to create beautifully printed books, which they used to for their brand yeah. books. Um, and now it's more like, um, you know, what would be really cool is if we put, uh, you know, all of our salespeople have apps on their, uh, sorry, all of them have iPads. And so can we create an app that they can open up and do the demo and the meet? It's more like that stuff. So that yeah. has been a huge shift. And, um, you know, for me, remote work, like I said, was already the norm um, pre-COVID, but I think COVID just accelerates all of that. And then specifically in my healthcare space, um, you know, digital health has gone from a thing that we had the technology for, but there were a lot of barriers to adoption to suddenly becoming fully mainstream out of necessity, which I think is a beautiful thing. Um, and I think that's going to open up so many doors and paths um, to better health in the future. So I'm excited about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, Susan, thanks so much for joining the show. Uh, for those listening, what's the best way for them to learn more about what you're doing and, and keep up with you? Um, my website is Susan Meyer Studio. Um, Meyer has a little bit of a funny spelling. It's M-E-I-E-R. Um, and all my info is there. You can also follow me on Twitter at Susan H. Meyer. And um, I have a download on my website um, for any smaller business owners um, or consultants out there like me um, who are looking for a kind of start guide for building your brand or refreshing your brand. Um, so if you want to check that out, that's available too. Wonderful. Well, again, I'd like to thank Susan Meyer of Susan Meyer Studios for joining the show. Thanks for listening to The Agile World with Greg Kilstrom. See you next week. Thanks again for listening to the Agile World Podcast, brought to you by Tech Systems. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can learn more and get a copy of my latest book, The Agile Workforce, from my website at theagile.world.